This is Children's Book Radio. Welcome back to Children's Book Radio, the podcast about children's books. This is show number 34 for February 4th, 2008. My name is Sabrina Weisler, and I am the host for this podcast. I am an avid reader of books for all ages and the parent of twins named Logan and Madison, who are learning to trace their names in their preschool class. I would like to welcome you to childrensbookradio.com if you are a new listener. Our subscriber base continues to grow with parents, teachers, students, and many other people who love children's books. Also, thanks to all of our listeners for telling their friends about the excellent books we discuss on Children's Book Radio. Please keep it up. If you have any comments, book recommendations, or just want to say hi, please send an email or an MP3 to be included in the podcast to sabrina at teachtopia.com. I encourage you to go right now to childrensbookradio.com. It is here that you will be able to get a list of all of the books we've discussed, order them if you'd like, and also find out how to subscribe to the podcast. Our website has an archive of all past shows for you to play right from your browser or to download to the device of your choice. If you're interested in advertising on our website or want to sponsor a show or shows, please write to sales at teachtopia.com and mention Children's Book Radio. As always, a special thanks to Mark Leonard for providing the Teachtopia Network theme song for our podcast. Remember, if you are a teacher or parent, make teachtopia.com your start page to always ensure a safe search engine. In this edition of the podcast, you will meet Kirby Larson, winner of the Newbery Honor for Hattie Big Sky. Hattie was inspired by Kirby's research into the history of her great-grandmother who homesteaded in eastern Montana in the early half of the 20th century. Kirby's love and enthusiasm for writing will inspire her readers to research their own histories because there are likely stories in everyone worthy of expanding. She has a wonderful website at kirbylarson.com where she offers writing tips such as camp out at a bookstore or library and read, read, read since reading is the best way to learn about how to write. In addition to Hattie Big Sky, I will also be reviewing her picture book, The Magic Kerchief, after the interview. Please welcome Kirby Larson. I'd like to welcome Kirby Larson today to Children's Book Radio. Thank you so much for being on our show today. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Great. Can you please introduce yourself to our readers and tell us how you got started in writing? I started writing for children about 20 years ago, but I have always been a passionate reader. And I think when you're a passionate reader, there comes a time when you want to try writing your own stories. So it was about 20 years ago I really got the bug. And actually, I remember the exact day it happened. I was reading a picture book with my children, and it was by Arnold Lobel and it's called Ming Lo Moves the Mountain. And when I finished reading that book to my kids, it, it was really like a little light switch went off inside me. And I knew right then that I had found what I wanted to do. Of course, it wasn't an overnight success story. <laughs> I started writing um, kind of, well, I went to the library a couple days a week and just wrote and wrote and wrote. And it took about three years before I really got focused and really understood what I was doing. Um, took some classes and workshops along the way. And, uh, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's been my journey for 20 years now. And you say you worked at the library. Why did you find this to be the best place for you to get to? Well, uh, when I started, my kids were really small. They were about uh, four and two, maybe, and maybe even a little younger. And so, uh, and we didn't have much money, so I arranged with my good friend. We traded babysitting, so I would watch her three boys two days a week, and she watched um, my kids a couple days a week, and the library was very close to, I'd take my kids to her house and then go, because um, the library is very close to where she lived, and then, you you know, you'd be away from distractions. And Do you find it hard to juggle um, trying to start doing this with being a mom? Well, I think, you know, I'm always amazed at people who have these high-powered jobs and are still moms. It, mm-hmm. it, was, a, it was a challenge for me. But I also think it's a perfect kind of job because you can, you aren't, you don't have to be away from your children and um, you can write, you know, during nap times, you can still really be present to your kids but still have the opportunity to write. So, yeah, I think there were struggles, but I think there's probably more struggles than other jobs trying to blend the two things. But again, having kids, you know, you're living with um, suppliers of ideas for 
potential books. So that was really fun too. And have your um, kids had the the writing spark as well? Have they started? Well, I think they're both wonderful writers. They're they're adults now, twenty seven mm-hmm. and twenty five, and I think they're fabulous writers. Our son actually is exploring that more directly. He went to film school in New York, and so he um, kind of has a dream to be a writer and director for mm-hmm. films. And our daughter is is more was more artistic, and so she's actually an interior designer but uses her wonderful writing skills and conveying ideas to architects and clients. So, um, But I do think they're both great writers. They were also both terrific readers, and I do think those two things go hand in hand. And what do they think about your writing? They're very proud of me yeah. right now, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think there were probably times when it's kind of like, oh, Mom, can you just, you know, <laughs> I don't know, just be a normal mom or whatever, but um, they're both very proud of me, and, and they got to see firsthand that it's, it's not an easy thing to do. It's a lot of struggling and a lot of disappointment. And I think that gave them the confidence to try some things that, um, you know, because they know that nothing's ever guaranteed or easy. Mm-hmm. So. And did you have any, like, a role model or a mentor that encouraged you or helped you along the way? You know, I get that question a lot, and I, I, I would say probably not a role model. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the most life-changing things for me was very early on, I attended a workshop that was led by Jane Yolen, and I'm mm-hmm. sure you know her name. She's, I've interviewed her yeah, for this podcast. She's a very, yeah. you know, she's very generous with her information. And um, she was doing a workshop, a 10-day workshop. Uh, oh, it's about a two-hour drive from where I live. And so I signed up to do that. And, and her, so it was set up so there would be morning lectures by Jane, and then afternoons were for riding or taking a walk or whatever the individual um, participants wanted to do. And her her lectures were fabulous. I'm still using notes I took from those lectures. But honestly, what really made the difference for me was the afternoon sessions, people started getting together to critique each other's manuscripts, Mm -hmm. and I had never participated in a critique session before, and that was very eye-opening. It was a particularly supportive group of people, Um, so they were encouraging, but they were also really honest Mm -hmm. and told me when, you know, a manuscript wasn't working. And I think really it's I've been fortunate to have some wonderful writing colleagues along the way. And so not necessarily a mentor, but maybe, you know, a dozen or so mentors that I've been um, you know, shown my manuscripts to in early stages of, along my writing journey and certainly have been very influential, very and helpful. How, and how did you um, go about getting published? Kind of the same story I'm sure most people would tell. I, um, well, I was reading a lot in the children's world and taking notes on publishers that I were doing books I admired and it just so happened at the time Patricia Riley Giff was oh, more than beginning but was kind of just kind of getting into her chapter book series the Polk Street mm-hmm. School kids books and my daughter was in about second grade in that time and just adored those books and we just read every single one together we could find and and then there weren't any more and it sort of dawned on me, well, wait a second, maybe this could be a niche for me to start in. And so the first book that I wrote and got published was a chapter book. Um, In fact, the first four books, two of them were both written, but two under my own name. And um, so I think that came from just knowing the market, doing a lot of reading, and taking apart her uh, Patricia Riley Gibbs books. They're fabulous examples of how to tell a good story. And um, taking those apart and understanding what how I could you know, incorporate that, not copy it, but incorporate that with my own style and voice. So I think that's, you know, and then sending, um, noting which publishers at that time were doing chapter books and then sending out, you know, (laughs) those manuscripts or query letters. I I don't remember now how many rejections I got early on, but, you know, we all have accumulated many, many dozens. So Mm -hmm. that's part of the process, too. And on your website, it says that you love to write. Um, you even write poison pen letters yeah. to businesses. Can you give us a couple of anecdotes of these? <laughs> well, I actually inherited that from my mother, who, when she is unhappy with some customer service, will write what she calls a poison pen letter. Now, the trick is you don't always send them because okay. sometimes it's just a way to vent. But um, I have, uh, for example, written you know uh, opinion letters to the editor. Um, I've written letters when I've been dissatisfied with service someplace and you know sometimes they get ignored and sometimes you get a comment back from someone so at least it lets you know it's a way to let your to vent some frustrations Mm -hmm. if you will but we jokingly call them poison pen letters in our family because 
That's what my mom always called them. And um, you have a blog on the Internet. Why do you have this blog, and do you think it's helpful in the writing process? You know, I to be perfectly honest, why do I have it? I was encouraged to start it by um, a young woman I was working with who was helping me do some marketing. Mm-hmm. And I'm not as faithful. A lot of bloggers are posting, you know, nearly every day or at least once a week, and I just don't seem to operate that way. But I was teaching a lot at the time, and I was finding that it, in all the different teaching circumstances, I was sort of sharing some of the same stories or, or noticing the same um, holes in people's writings. And so I thought, well, maybe I could put those ideas down. Um, so initially it was a blog with writing tips. Um, and then it's kind of become, I mean, especially since the Newberry, people kind of want to know what's happening with you. So it's become a little more personal, like describing school visits or the trip to D.C. to get the Newberry honor, that sort of thing. But I still like to think I'm I'm wrapping some insights about writing in some of those blog entries. And he, what's your response been to the blog, or have you gotten any? Uh, well, I know when I haven't posted any for a while, there's a few people who email me. It's like, <laughs> okay, time to get something up there. So um, I, you know, I don't. I'm sure there's a way to figure out how many readers you have. I don't know how many readers I have, um, but I, I you know. I, think people are reading it. People comment on it. So mm-hmm. <laughs> at least enough to notice when I haven't been writing. And what about um, all the conferences that you attend? Did you, what, what makes you decide to go to these conferences and what do you learn from attending them? Well, primarily at this point, I'm, I'm being invited as a speaker. So I'm mm-hmm. presenting um, either the store, you know, for example, at a reading association conference or a library association conference. They're often most interested in hearing about your journey, how you got be, you know, a writer, how you got mm-hmm. to this point in your life. Um, when I attend writing conferences, I talk a lot about the writing process, different different elements of it. Um, a particular topic I like to discuss is voice, because I think that's so key to uh, a compelling story, and I'm still studying it and figuring it out, so when I have to present on it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning for myself, too. So I think the point of going, I mean, on, on one level is to help people know about your book, Another level, I'm always learning from other writers and learning from my own experience teaching. You know, when you're prepping to teach something, I don't know if you've had this experience, but you always find out something new. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I, it is difficult, though, because this year has been an unbelievably travel-heavy year, which I didn't expect, and it is hard for me to write on the road. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to interview Roland Smith yet, He's a, he lives in the Portland area and writes terrific adventure um, stories. Mm-hmm. And he, he's on the road, oh, five times more than I am. And wow. I ran into him in Missouri, and he was giving me a hard time, you know, saying I was whining about not being able to write while I was on the road because he gets up at 3 or 4 in the morning and writes for a couple hours That's... before he goes to do a school presentation. Wow. You know, and I mean more power to him. I don't operate like that. And so it is really hard for me to write on the road. I give a lot of energy to my presentations, and by the time I'm done, I'm, I'm tired, you know. Yeah. I kind of need to be just a vegetable in the evening or whatever. But cr- you've been creative all day. It's hard to keep being creative at night. So. Exactly. But but maybe Roland will rub off. You know, he'll, yeah. he will shame me into working harder next time I go out on the road. Wow. Um, okay, let's go ahead and talk about Hattie Big Sky. This is okay. a personal novel for you. Can you mm-hmm. tell our listeners about your discovery about your great-grandmother and the um, the research that happened after that mm-hmm. this book? Well, the the story was triggered when I learned that my great-grandmother did homestead by herself as a young woman in eastern Montana, but I personally call this book my love letter to my grandmother. I was very close to my grandmother and spent a lot of time with her when I was growing up and then a lot of time with her at the end of her life, and we just had some wonderful conversations, and one day we were sitting at the kitchen table, and I remember we were folding kitchen towels, and just out of the blue, she made this comment that, The only time she said mom would have been her mom. The only time mom was ever afraid was in the winter when the wild horses stampeded. And I knew that mom was actually her stepmother, Hattie Brooks, who Mm -hmm. was this tiny, frail woman. You know, I knew her at the end. She was old when I knew her, and she was tiny and frail, and I couldn't imagine what she would have had anything to do with wild horses. And so I tried to ask my grandma for more about the story, but. Um, she had Alzheimer's then and just couldn't come up with anything else. So mm-hmm. that led me in a journey to understand um, 
well, A, if Hattie really had homesteaded, and B, what, you know, what what would that have been like for her? That, if you had known Hattie, she was a very shy, quiet woman, and I just couldn't imagine how she could pull something like that off, but she did. I was able to find her homestead documents by sending to the National Archives, um, and I, so I have copies of those, and she did in 1918, proved up on 320 acres in eastern That's Montana. Amazing. So, and so the, the claim that Hattie in my book um, is working on is at the exact location where Hattie, my uh, great-grandmother's claim was. I, I, that was part of my tribute to her. And she was alone, just the same way that Hattie she was alone. Along. Yeah, she actually went out at some point with some cousins, but um, I was able to find, um, oh, I, I guess you would call it a little township map, um, and I was able to discover that her claim was way off from where her co- her cousins did go out also to um, uh, mm-hmm. put out some claims, but they, she was quite a ways from them, and so she really would have been isolated. And not that they didn't, you know, get together occasionally or, or, you know, I would imagine they all pitched in and helped one another at harvest uh, or things like that. But she, she, her claim was kind of off all by itself. So she really was alone. Um, and in the book, Hattie lives in Ohio as the book opens and we find out that she, you know, she was orphaned as a young child. Can you just describe Hattie's life for us? Started it in Iowa is because that is where my great grandmother Hattie was from. She was born in Arlington, Iowa. And I, a lot of people did move from the Midwest. Um, they had experienced some success at farming, but they were looking for like something bigger or something more. And I'm sure you're a writer too, and so you know one of the biggest elements of a story is conflict and tension. Mm-hmm. So I made Hattie an orphan, so you know that's a lot of tension right there, a young girl on her own. And then, of course, you add more by making her, um, putting her in a situation where she isn't really welcome. And it's kind of funny because I've had a lot of people ask me to do a sequel to Hattie, and I was, I've, I've really been struggling with that, and I was talking with my husband the other day, and he said, you know, I think you ought to think about a prequel and tell a little bit about Hattie's life growing mm-hmm. up and, and um, her, her more of her life living with Aunt Ivy and Uncle Holt. So maybe I'll do that at some point, too. But um, basically, you know, I don't know if you've ever known people like Ivy, but they, they do things because they feel that they ought to, but they don't really have a heart for it, and so basically she took Hattie in because she felt it was her Christian duty, but she didn't really care for Hattie or have a, you know, I think she saw her as an annoyance mm-hmm. and um, and le- never was very good at hiding her feelings, so Hattie never felt welcome there, and um, I think that was just Ivy's personality. I don't know, you know, I, I just think that's the way she was. And at 16, and, um, Heidi seems a bit young to be tackling such a huge project that, you know, her uncle is left behind, let alone to live by herself. What does her age really say about her, though? Like, why did you choose 16, and do you think that it really was as important as people would think it would be? Well, first of all, when I was doing the research about um, the homesteaders, there would be six-year-olds who would be running up, you know, be behind a, a horse on a, on a plow. I mean, Amazing. Did, we think 16 is still young in mm-hmm. our contemporary society, but that would have been, she would have been, a, you know, could have been teaching had she been better educated. That was the start of your, young, you know, your life as an adult. And I, I loved that age of 16 because I felt like, you know, she wasn't technically of legal age. Um, so she was young enough and young enough to be impetuous and take on a, ta- you know, a task mm-hmm. like this where someone older might have more common sense. Um, but honestly, uh, there were 16-year-olds that were doing work equally as hard as, as I portrayed Hattie in the story, and even kids younger. You know, it was a hard life. It was a hard time for young people in that time period. And I also pick 16 because I think that's an age that readers now could connect with because it's the time if you are on that cusp of between being a child and being an adult and trying to figure out those important life questions like, you know, who am I? What what does it mean to be a decent human being? What does it mean to be a friend? You know, those things I see Hattie struggling with in her in her story. I see teens struggling with every day, too. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought there would be a good connection there. And the prejudice during World War One hits really hard and you know, in Tiny Vita. What did you learn in your research about how the Germans and the German-Americans were treated in Montana at this time? 
Well, it's interesting because when I first heard the snippet about Hattie being a homesteader, I thought I was going to end up writing this nice little homestead story. Mm-hmm. I had, I really was very ignorant about history in World War One, and I had no idea that the anti-German sentiment was so powerful. And it really kind of started in Montana. Um, I, I don't know that I could adequately explain it. I think it's sort of wrapped up in how powerful the, the mining companies were and there were a lot of immigrants who'd come to work in those kinds of situations and people were resentful of them, you know, getting, you know, farms established and whatever. I think it's a long, complicated reason for that. But, for example, the um, Sedition Act that was adopted nationally was based on an uh, act that was first introduced in Montana. Mm. So it was really a hotbed of, uh, of strong feelings and People were wrestling with that whole concept of what it means to be a loyal American. And if you were German or German-American, how could you be a loyal American because it was Germany that we were fighting? And so um, it was very intense. And uh, many of the, almost all of the elements of the story, the, the barn burning, the, mm-hmm. the book burning at the school, um, the being pressured to join the loyalty leagues, those were all based on actual events. So, I mean, I even read a story where a woman who worked in a restaurant was arrested because she served two roles to um, this guy. She was German-American, and she served two roles to this guy. And, you you know, they were, at the time, you were rationed, and you were only supposed to serve one role to Mm. a person in a restaurant. She was actually arrested for that. And I I think it was because she was German-American. Wow. So, it, it was just eye-opening to me and eye-opening to see that, you know, many of the things we're wrestling with now in contemporary society, we were wrestling with in a similar way in 1918. And Hattie is unsure of what to do at first when faced with this prejudice. What makes her take a stand? I think that's part of Hattie's journey, and Mm -hmm. I, I, I think she really doesn't like to cause trouble, and she would just really like to focus on, you know, getting her land, getting her property, but things come, just like in our lives, you know, we we would rather not face conflict, we would rather not face, I should maybe speak for myself, in my life, I would rather not Mm -hmm. um, face conflict or difficulties, but there are times when um, situations are put in front of you, and you do have to make a choice, and I think what Hattie realized is that it's, yeah, it's not a good thing to be judging people as a group to be stereotyping. And she knew too many people who were decent who were of German um, background. Mm-hmm. And so her, it was at some, you know, when she was pushed to that point, she realized, no, that wasn't the route that she was going to follow. Um, and she was scared to death when she stood up to them. But she also was had this sense that what she was doing was the right thing for her to be doing. Um, and Hattie ultimately fails in proving up her claim and harvesting her flax and her wheat, largely due to debt and bad, bad luck with weather. How did you decide to end with her leaving the claim? You know, I, again, I was um, tapping back on two things. First, what was a- actually happening um, in 1918 that most of the homesteaders who came were not successful in proving up because of weather and, um, and debts. Mm -hmm. that they had incurred but again it goes back to telling a story and stories are about conflict and I felt like it was I mean to me that was just that I always knew that Hattie was not going to be able to prove up on her claim but I think um, for me it was because there was a more important life lesson for her to learn and for me what that was was that it's not about a physical piece of property that you belong or that you find family or you find home. I mean, I, it, finding home is in your heart. And so mm-hmm. I think that's what Hattie came away with. And I think she came away with something even stronger, even though she didn't, wasn't able to keep the claim. And I think, you know, there just wasn't enough in eastern Montana to support all those people who did not prove up. And so most of them did kept, keep moving west. So that, again, what her choices really reflected choices that people at that time would have made. And what do you think has changed for her in terms of belonging to a family by the end of the book? Well, I think she has a family, a sense mm-hmm. of family with Paralee and um, Carl and, and the children. I think she, you know, I think she's finally found that family and that, you know, she realizes that that's what she was after, not a piece of property, not a house, mm-hmm. not a physical thing, but that sense of belonging. And I think she did find that with, with those dear neighbors. 
Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about uh, one of your other books I'm going to review, which is The Magic Kerchief. Mm-hmm. Um, it may be a children's picture book, but it's a, it's a lesson about kindness, and it speaks to older children as well. What was your inspiration for this book? You know, that is one of those books that just literally came to me out of midair. I, mm-hmm. I don't even know. I, I was always a fan of fairy tales and folk tales, and so I think something was you know, inside me to write that, but I honestly don't know what the trigger for that story was. But um, I, if I could just comment on your saying it's a children's picture book, a lot of libraries I'm going in now label their picture book section the everybody books. Hmm. And I think picture books really are a way for us to look at, um, you know, big big human issues, but in a, you know, friendly, safer way. And I, I actually think picture books um, apply to all ages. Mm-hmm. So I um, and I just I think there is that lesson in realizing that our words can uh, really hurt people. And you know, Griselda struggles with being honest. She's very proud of being honest, but she doesn't understand how her honesty crosses the line into hurtfulness until she is you know given the magic kerchief. And then she I think she doesn't a hundred percent figure it out, but I think the reader figures it out. And I know that when you've done. Um, school visits that you this is one of the books that you focus on mm-hmm. what reaction do you get from the children when you visit this? oh they, it, kids and librarians love love the book they think it's really fun and kids often um, there'll be an activity where they uh, dream up their own magic kerchief you know what would theirs do if they had a magic kerchief and it, it's really fun to see what kids come up with um, very touching sometimes to see what kids come up with but I think it's just again a you know, we can laugh at Griselda, and then, but there's always that little niggle like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I do this too sometimes. So it gives us a way to look at ourselves mm-hmm. without being too serious or too harsh on ourselves, but it gives us food for thought. And teachers love that book. They, they always love talking about it with their kids because that's a challenge for kids, you know, realizing that their words can be hurtful. And what about um, the illustration? Are you were you excited about it when you first saw it? Was that well? When I first saw it, it was very different than what I imagined because it's uh, light and humorous looking, mm-hmm. and I had sort of a more traditional image in my mind. And when I talked with my editor about that, she said what she really wanted to do was to have this book look different than other folk or fairy tales, which I think it does. Mm-hmm. And she wanted to play up the humor in the book, and I think they made a fabulous selection. It's just that, you know, we have an image in our mind when we're right. working on something, and this one was different than what I'm imagining, but I think they were exactly right in um, in the selection they made. I, 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 I never get tired of looking at those illustrations, and kids seem to really enjoy them. And I, I think if, if they'd gone with the traditional, more somber illustrations, the book would have been too dark and heavy. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, I think it was a perfect match. And what do the listeners of this podcast have to look forward from you next? What's coming up in 08? Well, the very next book that's coming out is a nonfiction picture book that I co-wrote with my friend Mary Nethery, Mm -hmm. and it's called Two Bobbies, A True Story of Hurricane Katrina, Friendship, and Survival. And it is the true story of a dog and a cat, both named Bobby, um, that survived Hurricane Katrina together. And um, it's just one of those wonderful inspirational stories that... I actually, um, I I was down in um, the Gulf Coast area several different times helping with Katrina cleanup, and I'd heard um, a story, all kinds of wonderful stories about, hopeful stories about animals surviving the hurricane, and then my friend Mary Nesri heard this particular story, so we put our heads together and, and did a lot of research and came up with the bodies. So I'm excited about that. That'll come out in August of 08 on the third okay. anniversary of the hurricane. Oh wow! From Walker Books. And then right now, honestly, I am working on another manuscript that I know my editor was hoping to have much earlier than she's going to get it. But because I've been on the road, it's just been a challenge for me. So, and I'm I'm not quite ready to talk about that one, but it is another historical novel. So, sounds exciting. Well, thank you so much for the interview today. Thank you very much. I appreciate the call. Thank you, Kirby. In Hattie Big Sky, the reader comes to see how hard work and determination can change a person's reality. Hattie has not been given an easy start in life. She is orphaned and her aunt is not too fond of her. 
but she is given a chance to start anew when a forgotten uncle gives her his unproven homestead in Montana. Hattie, while only 16, seizes the opportunity to start over, and with little more than energy and the enthusiasm to guide her, she takes off. What she lacks in family is soon replaced by colorful characters that Larson skillfully draws in a way that makes the reader come to care for each of them. Paralee Mueller is warm and down home with arms wide enough to hold Hattie tight. Unfortunately, her husband Carl is German, and anti-German sentiment in 1917 runs very high in Montana. Hattie finds herself in the middle of the debate and learns more about who she is when confronted with the bitter injustice of prejudice. Hattie's work on the land is mighty tough, especially for a 16-year-old girl, but she doesn't waver in her hope to prove up the claim and keep it as her own. She must lay down an enormous length of fence and plant flax and wheat and do it all in eight months in an almost unhospitable environment. Larson's skill as an author comes out in the narration for Hattie as a courageous spirit who learns what she is made of and where she wants to go through the course of the novel. The events throughout the book are unpredictable, and readers will learn a lot about what it is like to live in Montana and to prove a claim, while also understanding more about the prejudice against Germans during the First World War. The Magic Kerchief is a clever tale about a sour old woman who doesn't have friends in her small town and doesn't see the point in having them, beyond maybe the weight of loneliness, until one day when a stranger comes to her door. The stranger uses Griselda's home as a place to rest and then bequeaths her a magic kerchief as for her generosity. The kerchief turns Griselda's unpleasant exchanges with the locals into words of kindness, which puzzles both Griselda and the town folk. The villagers then start to see her as a kind woman, and Griselda learns the value of having friends. She, also, she has missed out on so much but didn't realize it. Readers will learn the value of kindness, but also how easy it can be to brighten someone's day. The illustrations are also amusing and will give pre-readers a lot to respond to. Thanks again, Kirby, and I want to thank all of you for listening to Children's Book Radio. Please visit our website at childrensbookradio.com and support our advertisers. Also, please email me at sabrina at teachtopia.com with any suggestions about the podcast or book recommendations. I'll be back soon with another edition of this podcast. Bye for now. Mm-hmm.